Marinero, the sick podcast, and today we are talking college basketball. We're talking NCAA. We're talking March Madness, and who better to bring in than once a coach, always a coach. He coached at Manhattan. He coached at Villanova. He coached at UMass, and now he does color commentary work for CBS and CBS Sports Network. Coach Steve Lapis, good afternoon, or as they would say in Greek, Yasu. <laughs> How are you guys doing up north in Canada? We're doing extremely well and joining me. And Yasu, by the way, for hello, not for good afternoon. I know that. Right. Uh, John D'Angelis, a Greek himself. How would you say good afternoon in Greek? Kalimera. Oh, Kalimera. Coach, there you go. How are you, my friend? Laringi. It's been so, so long. I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to see you here, man. You look amazing. Thank you, John. It's great to see you. And I'll tell you this uh, for the audience out there to know, you know, I went to a lot of practices over my <laughs> career, recruiting and stuff. And the most enjoyable and the best that I ever saw were John D'Angelis' practice. This guy was, when you got a kid from him, you got somebody that knew the game, understood what you were talking about. And that's not always the case. So I appreciate everything that John did. John is a wow. heck of a coach. Well, I'm happy. Hold on a second, John. If I can, coach, I'm happy to hear that because I never saw him coach basketball, but I saw him coach soccer, by the way. <laughs> it, it's probably the first time I've seen at the end of a practice, somebody ask his players to do laps, to do jumping jacks, to do push-ups. And I'm happy to hear he's a great basketball coach because when it comes to soccer, he has no idea. That's right. You <laughs> know what? Can't know everything. Coach, you're being nice to me, but you didn't tell him the truth. I ordered some lamb. I ordered some souvlakis. I had some tzatziki on the side. We had some thermosalata. You know what I mean? So, of course, you're going to say some nice things about me. But, Coach. No, no, no. That's, see, that, that, that's ridiculous because I mean it. I used to go there, and we'd come home. I'd be with my assistant, and we'd come home, and we'd talk about his practice and what things we could pick up and use from there. But we did do – Zadziki wow. and Taramosalata and all those things. We did that too. There's no doubt. We went out a couple of times. We had a great time. I used to go up there and I had to go, I had to go on vacation for a week after I was done with these guys. <laughs> hey, hey, John, that's that's kind of that's that's kind of kind of kind of cool, huh? To to hear Coach Lapis say that about you. That's pretty cool. Yes, it is. I mean, like, yeah. you know what? You know, we, we try our best to learn from the best. And You're right. um Coach, thank you for the kind words. You know, it's been a long time since uh, I coached a game or ran a practice. But, uh, I, I mean, coming from you, you know, when you you, know, you won a national championship as an assistant coach, you went to four NCAA tournaments and won an NAT, NIT championship in nine years of Villanova. Naismith Coach of the Year in 1995. I mean, Coach, I mean, the resume speaks for itself. I mean, when you're on – when you're on TV and you're on the radio and you're talking about hoops, I mean, everybody stops and listens and you know exactly what you're talking about. And, and we're just really lucky to have you here. Well, I appreciate that, John. And you know, the one thing that I always felt and you feel, and that's why you were the coach that you were, is that you can always learn from somebody else. And, you know, all these things that we do, we really didn't invent them. You know, they came from us accumulating knowledge from other people and you know one thing about this game and probably any sports probably the same there's always something new to learn and uh i think if you have that attitude that's what makes you a good coach and you know my son is a coach now at fairly dickens and he's an assistant coach and uh hopefully that's what he believes too you know what just a little sidebar i just got to talk a little bit about my soccer coaching first of all when you don't know that much about a sport you got to make sure the kids get in shape. You know <laughs> what I mean? Every so sport. That's, every you get, that's in any sport. So you get them in shape, and hopefully in the last 10 minutes of the game, you run the other team off the field. John, if I can, John, if I can, I will tell you that I was told that you did have the best conditioned team in the league. So for Thank that, you. Thank you. I give credit where credit is due. Thank you, Tony. I'm not so sure how much it helps them with passing the ball and kicking it or scoring goals, but hey, you know what? Conditioned, yes, once, 100%. We do what well, we I can. Will tell, I will tell you this. In any sport, the most important thing that you can do is play harder than your opponent. And yes. you have to be in shape, and you yes. have to want to play harder. So that's got nothing to do with passing or kicking or <laughs> anything else. Playing hard and playing unselfishly, that goes in any sport. 
Hey, so who am I? Hold on a second. Who am I to question or to actually debate Coach Steve Lapis, who you know has, has coached, and I haven't. So who am I? But I, I I'd like to beg to differ if I can. <laughs> the number one thing to do in sports is not to work harder than everyone else. If I had to choose one, it would be to work smarter than everyone else. See, I would I would say play harder than everybody else. That's where I would go. John, but what happens if you play hard, but you don't play smart? You know what? Playing hard can overcome smart sometimes. Smart can <laughs> overcome playing hard. I don't think. You know what? I'm not going to argue with Coach Steve Lapis any <laughs> yeah, further. Right. I'm probably going to end no, up no, losing it, this one. It, it's a good philosophical debate. No, no. It, yeah. You, you, have, you have a very valid point that a lot of people probably believe. And there's probably a lot of people that believe what I say. So it's a valid argument. No question. Coach, uh, go, ahead, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, if I can, Coach, I'd lo I'd love to talk about Gonzaga with you, Coach. Uh, as we as we we move along here, they're thirty and zero. Um, the the last two games can either make or break this historic run here for Gonzaga. The only team that went completely undefeated and won the championship was Indiana in 1976. So the Bulldogs here have a chance to share that honor with them. Do you believe they will, yes or no, and why? Yeah, I, I do believe they will. Um, number one, they, they've they been the best team in the country really almost for two years now. And the reason why I think this team will win the championship is they have the best blend of outside and inside. You know, when you have a guy like Drew Timmy, 6'11", in the lane, who shoots 68% from the field, he's a, he's a tremendous scorer in the college game. And then you surround him with four guys that can all shoot, all pass, all dribble. They have, and those, they're, you know, they're three guards outside, Nemhard, Ayayi, and Suggs. They're all 6'5". They all could be point guards. They all could be two guards. And then you throw in a four-man like Corey Kispert, who shoots 48% from the three-point line, the best shooter in the country. And now all of a sudden, that big guy's got all kinds of space. So when you, when you put it together, inside, mm -hmm. outside, how do you guard them? And the thing about them, John, as you know, is they play so fast. They're up and down the court in transition. They all are great passers. The ball is moving, boom, 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 everywhere. They scored 92 points a game. They had three games this year where they scored less than 80. Yeah, and, and I it's think, a, and I ahead, think, they do the, I think, sorry, coach, the, and I think they do the, the two things that Tony, you are debating. Mm -hmm. Not only do they play really hard, but they play smart. They yeah. follow That's the, the best combination. That's the best. And, and they play together, which is the third best combination, because they've all decided they want to win a national championship. Yeah. And they go and they play, play through the guy who in that game will give them the best chance to win. And so far it's been Timmy. And I just think it's going to be really, really hard. And if there is one coach in the final four that can figure out a way to slow them down and give his team a chance. It's Mick Crone at UCLA. He has been unbelievable, the job he's done at UCLA so far. I mean, slowing the game down, yeah. putting guys in the right spots, you know, getting guys off double screens, um, defending really hard, Coach. They play hard. Coaches, guys, play really hard. It could be that one team that can beat them, maybe. We'll see. They, they play very hard. The problem for them is going to be, can they control the tempo of the game against Gonzaga? Yes. Yes, That's been the, and you know USC came out and they wanted oh. to play slow. They got blown. They got their doors blown off the other. Yeah. Day. So, you know, Mick Cronin though, when he was at Cincinnati, he played a slow tempo. His team is used. They play, they're one of the slowest playing teams in the country. So this is what they do. They're not trying to do it just for this game. Yes. And I think that's something that helps them. Is this is how they play? You know, other teams. Some teams play reasonably fast, and they say, "Oh, we got to slow it down." And you can't, they can't do it effectively. This team plays slow all the time. So that's, that's what gives them a chance. I think it's going to be tough because they got to shoot yeah. the ball really well. And they're, they've are they shot the ball well in the tournament so far, but they're not a really good three-point shooting team. And that's going to be important because you got to think Gonzaga's going to get 70. That's they're right. That's game, right. But yeah, they're going right. to get 70, and you got to get that's 71 or 72. Of that's right. Game. That's right. It's uh, the SICK Podcast. You can go to sportbuffshop.com for all – of your officially licensed sports apparel and more, use code SICKHOODIES15 for 15% off on all hoodies of all your favorite teams. You know, Coach Gonzaga, 
the fact that they're, they make me think of the 2007 New England Patriots. Let me explain. Gonzaga has beat every team here by 10 plus points with the exception of one team in one game. The 2007 New England Patriots, and I'm going to compare it to another team in another sport, they were 16-0 and in the regular season. They won the divisional playoffs. They won the AFC Championship. But get this. They lost in the Super Bowl to the New York Giants. Can UCLA, 11th seeded UCLA, be basketball's, college basketball's version of the 2007 New York Giants? I don't think UCLA can, but Baylor might be able to in the championship game because Baylor does have four, three really explosive guards that are capable of controlling a game. Mm -hmm. And they don't have great offensive players. They're big guys, but they're pretty good defenders. They're athletic. They're long. So I will say I think that UCLA will do their best to keep this thing, you know, reasonable. But I think that Baylor has the best chance. If anybody's going to beat them, I think it's going to be Baylor. You know what? I agree with you. My only concern is that Baylor's got to give by Houston. That's going to be a heck of a matchup. Everybody's talking about the Gonzaga-UCLA game, but you, you want to talk about two teams that are very similar? They both defend enormously well, like just incredibly well. They both rebound incredibly well. They're both streaky shooting teams. And it's going to go up and down. There's going to be a lot of one-on-one -on -one basketball. Guys are going to get in the paint, make yeah. plays. I, I think that's going to be a heck of a game. I just think at the end, I don't know, Coach, if you agree with me or not, I think Baylor might just be a little bit too physical for them up front. Yeah, I, I think that that is definitely the case. And and they have a guy, you know, I mean, Jared Butler. He's a first-team All-American. He has not played great in the NCAA tournament. And I'm kind of looking for him to break out in, in this game. And they have another guard named Davion Mitchell, who like, is one of my favorite players in the country. He's a, a tremendous defensive player. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. He can take it to the basket. He shoots three. So I just think they have a certain amount of physical toughness. Not that Houston's not. Houston's a tough. Houston, one yeah. of the best defensive teams in the country. But this Baylor team might have a little bit too much offensively. And that's where that's where Houston could struggle because they don't they don't have as many good offensive players as Baylor does. He is Coach Steve Lapis, uh, and he, of course, coached for the longest time with uh, Manhattan, with uh, Villanova, with UMass, and now is doing some color commentary for CBS and CBS Sports Network. You're listening and watching the Sick Podcast. You can listen to us on all social media platforms, and you can watch us on Facebook and Instagram at the Sick Podcast. Like it and share it with your friends. Coach, I've always been a fan of coaches. I've always been one to think that in any sport that coaching is so incredibly important and can make a difference. And so I ask you who coached now that you get down to the final four, how important is coaching and can that be the edge for a team down the stretch here? Let me say this. These guys are all good coaches. You know, I think the one thing that you find I coached in high school too for a while. And when you yeah. coach in high school, you find that, you know, there's only a handful of guys that are really good coaches because a lot of the other guys are doing it to make some extra money. You know, not everybody's as serious as you are, but like John D'Angelis was about yeah. coaching his team. That's number one. When you get to the collegiate level, everybody's paying the bills by doing this. Of so course. Everybody, there are very few people. And I say this in, in the truest of ways. There are very few. I coached over 500 Division One games, and wow. on one hand, and and on one hand, I can count the guys that weren't good coaches. They're all good coaches. Now, what happens during the course of a game? You make a decision. It doesn't work for you. It works for him. You know, everybody's got their reasons for doing. Like, look at Mick okay. Cronin the other day. The other yeah. day, he doesn't foul. They're up three with five seconds to go, and Alabama's got to go the length of court. Me personally, I would foul in that situation every single time. Not when I coached, but I, now that I've watched it as a commentator. Yeah, perfect. Know, it's funny. I do it every Coach, time. I, I love where you're going with this. I really love where you're going for this. So well, for the casual point. fan, for the casual fan who's watching right now, okay, and you're probably going to be able to rattle off 20 things here off the top of your head in the next 20 seconds, who's trying to figure out how important coaching is 
and what coaches are doing and what adjustments they're making, what should they be watching out for? Well, in, in that particular situation or in general, you know what I mean? In, so, so in, in general, g- give them, give the casual fan examples of, of coaching. You know, I mean, there's like a million, th- like for guys like me and John that kind of know what's going on and have done this our whole lives, we're seeing things out there that the average fan really not, not only is not going to see, but really doesn't need to see, you know, okay. because we're trying to, we're trying to teach our guys. The one thing about coaching, your goal is to control as many things as you can. And there's a lot of things you can't control, which people don't realize when you coach control as many things as you can and put the odds in your favor. Whatever you do, it may not work, no matter what it is, and no matter what the odds are. For example, that particular play. So Mick Cronin decides he's not going to foul. I believe he should foul every time. Now, after the game in the press conference, they asked him why he didn't foul. And he said, I was afraid that once they threw the ball up court, that our guys would foul while a guy was trying to take a three-point shot, and I didn't want to take that chance. I don't agree, but that's a valid reason. You know what I mean? He's a great coach. I thought he made a mistake there, in my opinion. But he had a reason for doing what he did. So all these coaches out there that people question their decision, they have a reason for the decision, whether you agree or disagree. They know what they're doing. Now it's a matter of whether it works out right or not. In that case, he could have got burnt. Because the you know what? The, three, the kid made the three, and they You're ended up right. winning in overtime. Yeah. You know what? It's funny that you say that. I'm sorry, John? Because, because – during the, the during the game, the TV guys were saying that Coach Cronin fouls all the time, I and know. for this time he decided not to foul Tony to burn them. Yeah, but they say he fouls all the time. One of the things I'll tell you, and I'll talk a little X's and O's here in front of coaches. One of the things they'll both look to do in the first five minutes of the game is they're going to look at each other and see how they play the ball screen and what they're going to do against the ball screen action. So will they? hedge the ball screen? Will they trap the ball screen? Will they do different things? So these are defensive terminology. So they'll kind of feel each other out in the first five minutes and say, hey, these are different things we, we, we might try to do. But like Coach says, like there are so many things going on in the game. For example, the Michigan game. A lot of people were saying, why wasn't the big kid, is it Hendrickson, Coach? Who's that? Big kid from Michigan. Um, uh, Hendrickson, Rick Dickinson, Dickinson. Why wasn't he getting the ball further up the box, you know, like more higher so that he can use a counter move and they were taking away one side, you know what I mean? So there's little things that coach and I see and other people won't, but I think the one thing you're going to see in the UCLA Gonzaga game that every fan will see is one team's going to try to play super fast and one t- team is going to try to take the air out of the ball and just like run their offense. And you know we the, were, the problem now. The problem nowadays is it's not like the old days. In the old days, when there was no shot clock, which is before you yes. guys were born, uh, you, you know you couldn't. Uh, you know you could hold the ball for five minutes. You got thirty seconds now. So you speaking about no it. shot clock. Speaking yeah. about no shot clock, coach. Speaking about no shot clock. You cut the nets down as an assistant coach. Yep. Was there a shot clock that year? No, that was the last no. year of no shot clock. That was the last year of no shot clock. And what did you guys do, Coach? Tell everybody what you guys did against a much more favored team. Well, you know what we did here? Now, the next year, the 45-second shot clock came in. It wasn't 30. It was 45. And we they, we had, we watched that game over the next year to see. <laughs> we would have had one shot clock violation in the game. Now, of 45 seconds. So we were holding, but we were, we were getting it down to 38, 40 seconds. And... There's no doubt we were milking it. We didn't milk it beyond 45, but we milked it pretty good, no doubt. And how did that feel, Coach? What, what are these teams going to feel like when one of them cuts the nets down? Like, tell us what it feels like. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I don't have a ring. I, I, don't have a ring. I can't get through airports. It feels great, but it was so long ago, I almost don't remember. <laughs> I mean, we're talking 35 years ago. Wow. 30, 37, 36 years ago. So, no, I remember. It was an unbelievable feeling. Um the crazy thing for me was it was my first year in college. I was a high school coach the year before. Wow. Now, the next year, you know, my first year as an assistant at Villanova, we win the national championship. So it was like a it's, it was like a blur. 
And, you know, the next day we're, we're they're having a parade for us in Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm sitting on this. I mean, the year before I was coaching in the Bronx. And now I'm on a float in a parade down Broad Street in Philadelphia. People are throwing <laughs> confetti at us. It's just, it was an unbelievable experience. There's no doubt. With, uh, with former Villanova assistant and coach of Manhattan, Villanova and UMass, he is Coach Steve Lapis. I'm Tony Marinero, and along with John D'Angelis, we're talking NCAA. We're talking March Madness. Earlier today, Coach Williams, who led the North Carolina Tar Heels to three NCAA championships, uh, retired after 33 seasons as a head coach. He had spent 15 years at Kansas and 18 with North Carolina. You talked about good coaches. Your thoughts on Coach Williams retiring after 33, count them, 33 seasons as a head coach. I mean, I've known Roy for a long time. We met in 1985 when I was an assistant. We played them to go to the Final Four at North Carolina that year. And uh, here's what I can say about Roy. He's a better, he's a great coach, and he's a better guy than he is a coach. He's just a phenomenal person, as, uh, as humble and as simple for a guy who's accomplished the things that he's accomplished in his life. I mean, you can't really find a more humble, better guy. So uh, uh, the game's going to miss him. And he's, I, think, I think part of him retiring is, is a frustration with some of the rules that are, and things that are going on now with transfers and things like that in college basketball. But, you know, he's an old school guy. Dean Smith guy, coached at Kansas before he was in North Carolina. Tremendous coach, but like I said, an even better guy. Coach, I heard it's because he wants to bring his handicap down. He's a good golfer, too. I, I've never played with him, but he's a good golfer. He's not a hack like me. <laughs> or me, man. <laughs> Greeks, I, we're hackers. <laughs> I, still, I still don't understand how people find five to six hours in a day to play golf. I mean, I'm sure it's a fun sport to play, and you get to pass the time, but where do people have this time, five to six hours to play golf, or at least well, the way I play? Well, it should be four hours, and <laughs> I know I play like 200 rounds a year now, which is one of the reasons why I love my job now is I only work from November to April. No recruiting, no nothing. I'm free wow. from April to November. So I play golf, I got a lot, and I got a bunch. You know what? It's like when I was a kid. My wife told me this uh, the other day. She goes, when you were a kid, you went to the park every day, you played basketball. <laughs> now you're 67. You go to the golf course every day and play golf. What the heck is that? You're doing the same thing. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> you should you should get her to play with you. No, no, that's okay. Take it easy. <laughs> I go there and there's like 30 guys and we have a good time. Like we did. So I'm telling you, we're like little boys again. We're all there hanging yeah. out, gambling a little bit, like we like to do. You know, laringi, laringi, laringi. Yeah. That's it. And I think <laughs> With uh, Coach Steve uh, Lapis. Uh, Coach, um, talk to us about, if we can here in ending, the college game right now, the athletes that we're seeing, um, the way the game has evolved, the way the athletes have just taken it to another level. Um, have you ever seen the game this good? Have you ever seen players like this? Well, let me say this. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that kids aren't getting better. Bigger guys are not stepping out. And the, you know, when I was a kid, a big guy played two feet from the basket. Now the big guy can step out, make threes, make passes, handle the ball. I mean, look at this guy Jokic for, for the Denver Nuggets. I mean, it's like uh, yeah. you never. You didn't see that. You know what I mean? Growing up, but the college game has suffered greatly, I think, by guys leaving early. I mean, like, I like people are asking me, is this Gonzaga team one of the, the greatest teams of all time? And I say, no. Are they having one of the greatest seasons of all time? Absolutely. But are they one of the greatest teams of all time? I mean, are they better than that UNLV team in 1991? No. Are they better than when, when North Carolina had Jordan, Worthy, and Perkins? Are they better than them? No. So, I mean, it's a great team, and they're having a historic once-in-a-lifetime season. But they are not one of the best teams in the history of the game, in my opinion, because their best, maybe their second best player is a freshman. Now, if Jalen Suggs is a senior, there's a different story. But you don't see great seniors anymore. The, the highest draft, the three first picks in the draft, the first three picks in the draft is your old freshman. In the old days, those guys were seniors that played for four years. You know how good those teams were back then? Those teams were better. Yes, kids have gotten better, but now they're gone after their freshman year. Had they you know Senior year will be different. You know, Coach, the one thing that I would say is if you look across the board, man, there's a lot of low-scoring games. 
like games in the 40s and the low 50s. You know, teams, they're not making shots. Uh, it's the, the percentage is like, tell me about that. Tell me like what it is as an analyst compared to like what, you know, you know, if the games are in the 70s or 60s, is that, is that part of the, because there's not a lot of seniors and the top players are leaving? Do you believe that? Or is it, or is it because the coaches just want to control the game more? Tell me no. what you think. Yeah, no, I think I think it's because the the, the, the kids that are, are gone. And, and the other thing is what we've seen is in the NCAA tournament, this always happens where teams play much closer to the vest. They don't run as much. You're playing better teams, so you're not turning people over as much. So there isn't as much transition. So there's a lot more half court. People are playing it. I mean, that like Michigan all year was scoring 75 points a game, 77 points a game. Even UCLA, Mick Cronin, who normally doesn't, they average like 75 a game, and that game was 51-49. So, you know, I think it's a product of, in the regular season, kids aren't as good because we have, like I said, the best players leave after their freshman year, so they're not there to continue to develop. And number two, in the NCAA tournament in particular, people start playing a little bit tighter because the stakes are higher. You ready for you ready for this last one? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I think you know, it's, I think it's going to be an interesting doubleheader. I'm uh, hoping UCLA can keep this thing within earshot because it's not yeah. fun to watch a game like we did with USC the other night. And uh, I think the Baylor Houston game is going to be a great game. Um, you know, two teams from Texas have never played in a Final Four before. So, and they used to be in the old Southwest Conference years ago, Baylor yeah. and, uh, and Houston. So uh, they've never played in the NCAA tournament. Baylor hasn't been to a Final Four since 1950. So uh, it should be an interesting game. Coach, it's the question that everyone keeps asking and everyone has an opinion. Here it goes. Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Oh, my God. I mean, you can never... My, well, well, hold on a second. I, I would say God would be number one, to, to answer. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay. Well, we know that. Um, but, you know, I go back and forth with this with my son, you know. And I got to be honest with you. Now, I'm going to come from somewhere else. Why in that argument is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar never talked about? You take a look at what Kareem did compared to those two guys, every bit, every bit as good as either one of them. But if we're going to have the Jordan-LeBron argument, I'm a, I'm a little old. I think the guys from my generation go more for Jordan and the younger people go more for LeBron. But you know what? I'll take either one of them on my team any <laughs> And you know what? And I bet you either one of them would have taken Coach Steve Lapis to be part of their coaching staff. Coach, this has been a pleasure for me. I, I know it's a pleasure for John. And in the end, I'll tell you this, I don't know who's going to win, uh, but I would think that it's going to be the team that does the most jumping jacks, push-ups, <laughs> and laps. It's going to be the most conditioned team. It's the Sick Podcast. Absolutely. By my bookie, use code Sick Picks for a 50% deposit bonus. Bet, win, get paid. Coach, let's do this again sometime soon, okay? Would love to. Thank you, guys. Great seeing you, Johnny. Yeah, my man, I love you. Take care, love Coach. You too, kid. He's Coach Steve Lapis. He's John D'Angelis. I'm Marinero. The three amigos, we all love each other. It's the Sick Podcast.